Dr. Rajudri, good morning. Good morning. Just start in one minute thing. No worries, no worries. Mary Pahin, this class is all good. Madam, I am here. Dr. Shah. Yes, sir. Yes. बोलची जे काल के रात्रि वाला आर बोल रहे ना हमारे एक तो ये नो तुन मैकबुक टाशर पड़े एप्पल के तो मैं एप्पल एर फैन हमारे समस्त डिवाइस गुले टुले हमार भाई पेरियनल फिशियल और डॉक्टर मूवी गुले चल ची माने केस स्टडीज़ एर मूवी गुले चल चना तो हम एमनी डॉक्टर ठीक आचे इन्तु उसे मूवी गुल स्टैटिक पिक्चर गुलो पापो तो ना हाँ स्टैटिक पिक्चर गुलो सब आते हैं हाँ ठीक 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 है सारा मूवी गुलो मूवी गुलो थकले भालो तो आरके माने रियल टाइम देखा जाता है हाँ हाँ अबे अमी ताऊ देख ची जरी तकनो जाए ओके अनदर मिनट ओके या या Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, today we are having a, a radiology session. 
uh, with Dr. Shubhra Rai Chaudhary is a very uh, uh, eminent uh, intervention radiologist in Kolkata and he teaches very well. And uh, the pelvic MRI, particularly MRI for uh, perianal fistulas are very important in our day-to-day -day practice. But most of the surgeons uh, cannot clearly interpret all the uh, findings in a MR fistulogram. So today, uh, Dr. Shubhra Rai Chudiri will go take us through the pelvic MRI, particularly uh, MR fistulogram. So Dr. Shubhra Rai Chudiri, please uh, share your screen and start. We are all uh, viewing. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Makonde, you're, you're, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about MRI of perianal fistula. I'm not, uh, particularly the role of MRI in perianal fistula with some um, kind of overall view about where does MR stand in the algorithm of managing an uh, MRI uh, in perianal fistula. Now, this is not a very recent uh, topic in terms of this talk was prepared in 2014, so that's eight years ago. But to be honest with you, not much has changed since 2014 in terms of uh, the science of perianal fistula. So fistula is a very common uh, condition with an incidence of 8.6 uh, cases per 100,000 population. The key is to identify a high and complex anal fistula because to reduce the incidence of recurrence and to reduce the incidence of sphincter injury related to the accompanying surgery. An MRI can be used to identify the primary tract and the complex features of fistula in NO. And this is where I want to talk to you about that what are the components of perianal fistula that we need to identify on MR and which is helpful for the surgeon. And it is actually the oldest surgical disease. Makada, is that right? It is the it is the oldest described surgical disease in humans. Yeah. Uh, and it spared nobody. You know, this all swell that ends well, Shakespeare. And, and you know, the, the courtyard, uh, court, courtyard asks, what is it, my good lord, the king languishes of? A fistula, my lord. So this is, uh, uh, this, this is Shakespeare, but that is 1490, right? And to be honest with you, the oldest surgical treatise on treating a surgical disease, 1376 AD. And as you, as you can see, even in that time, somebody said that it is almost impossible to cure a fistula. In an so uh, this is old English at the time of Chaucer. And even then, surgical uh, fistula in Eno was supposed to be a very difficult condition to treat. And till recently, and I, and I mean by till recently, is still the mid 90s, the surgeon's examining finger or an examination under anesthesia was the gold standard in classifying an anal fistula. So that has obviously changed all of you who are the newer generation of surgeons don't believe in this, I know. But this was a, a thought till certainly when both Dr. Shah and I was training, this was the, the prevailing wisdom. Now, it sort of started changing uh, uh, with papers like this. And this is my boss, John Spencer. And I was very lucky to be trained under him about perianal fistula. And that is, this is MR classification. And of course, this is this is a radiological classification as opposed to the Parkes classification. And uh, we'll talk about the similarities and what you need to work out. Now, why is it so that MR is good in perianal fistula? Because if you look at the causes of recurrence in a patient's anal fistula, and as you know, in certain series, the recurrence rates of perianal fistula can be as high as 66%. Now, if you look at the causes of recurrence, the most important causes are these. Inadequate drainage, poor wound care, lateral pockets, superior extensions, submucosal tracts, 
identifying the correct crypt that is the source of the anal gland inflammation and Crohn's disease, right? So these are the causes of recurrence. And of them, as you can see, MR can detect all of these apart from poor wound care. So that is why MR is superior. And there are some misconceptions, like all tracts can be seen or felt at EUA. That's a wrong conception. Endoanal ultrasound is superior. That is wrong. I mean, I, I used to do this myself with hydrogen peroxide, and I can tell you from personal experience that it is not. And MRI is expensive, okay? And the examination under anesthesia is even more expensive. So uh, the aim should be to do the EUA and operate once and to reduce the recurrence by treating all the tracks and all its extensions in one go if possible. Now, this is uh, uh, John Buchanan's paper from, uh, uh, from St. Mark's in London in Radiology 2004. And it looked at uh, clinical examination versus anal endosonography versus MRI imaging. And it looked at these following characteristics, the primary tract, then regarding the extensions, they talked about abscesses, the horseshoes, the internal opening. And of course, the one that I report in addition is the side branches. So if you look at, this is all that you need to look at is the primary tract, whether there is a tract abscess, whether there is any intersphincteric or perisphincteric horseshoe, where is the internal opening, and whether there are any side extensions. That is all you need to look at. Now, John Buchanan looks at the top four. And if you look at the, the data of clinical examination versus anal endosonography versus MR imaging, you can see that MR is actually significantly better at identifying the tracks. That is 90%, abscess 85%, horseshoes 94%, internal openings 97%. Now, this is where I slightly sort of disagree because internal opening, particularly if chronic and fibrotic, can be a little bit more difficult to identify an MR unless you use contrast. So this is the only place where the use of IV contrast or gadolinium is actually useful is to identify the internal opening. So, so you can see that MRI is superior. Now that main question that you need to ask is, okay, fine. But does it help the surgeon? You know, it's great to say that you can see it, but does it help the surgeon? So this is Buchanan's paper again in from Radiology 2004 and Lancet 2002. 71 patients with recurrent fistula divided into two groups. The first group, which the surgeon acted uh, on clinical grounds only, and the one and the other group in which the surgeon acted on MR and the UA. Okay, so the first one is clinical followed by EUA and the second one is MR followed by EUA. And you can see that the, uh, the risk of recurrence is 57% when acted on clinical grounds alone and 16% when acted on MRI as well. So MRI is superior to surgical exploration for depicting all the tracts. Now this slide is wrong in 2022, uh, but uh, in obviously, in 2014, when MR was not as widespread, we were not still doing MRI for every case, okay? But we still believe that it should be done in all cases if you have got the resource, because it changes management in at least 10%, but it is not often practical. So we used to do it in recurrent disease, suspicion of a complex fistula, in other words, good salts rule, you know, uh, you know, good salts rule, yeah, if it's the fistula, the distance of the, of the fistulas opening from the anal canal, the, first, so the good salts rule is anterior versus posterior, but also if a perianal fistula external opening is further away from the anal opening, then it's likely to be more complex. So suspicion of a complex fistula, multiple openings, for example, is a complex fistula, all patients with Crohn's disease, and also monitoring treatment with infliximab. So these were the indications we were using it. I must admit today, I'm sure it is your practice, that we do it for almost every case. So the key to understanding the anatomy of perianal fistula is to understand is to understand the anal clock. Now, as the talk goes on, there will be pictures on the left hand side, and just uh, just uh, see whether you can identify these people. Just as an aside, this is just fun. 
So uh, the NL clock is from six o'clock, nine o'clock, 12 o'clock and three o'clock. And that is how, as you are looking at the anal canal from the foot of the patient. So similar to how you would do a CT or MRI. So that's very important. So this is, this picture here is the six o'clock anal clock fistulascoping. So then I come to the anatomy and I, I'm not trying to teach the converted already. And this is something that you guys know very well. Um, but I would still like to go through this anatomy. And I would just like to tell you that each of this is very well seen on the MRI. So if you look at the circular muscle of the rectum, sorry, the black is the circular muscle of the rectum, which continues down into the anal canal as the internal sphincter, right? Then you've got the levator plate from both sides coming, condensing around the pubo anal sling, which will be like this. And then it will continue down as the fibers of the external sphincter, okay? It, it has superficial and deep parts, but basically it is this is the gray is the external sphincter. So this is the muscle and the sphincter anatomy, okay? Now, if you look at the uh, rectum again, then this is the dentate line where the anal glands circumferentially reside. And the crypt inflammation starts to happen at this level and then it comes out as a fistula, right? So this is what you need to understand. And this is, I will show you how you can see this on the, and sorry, this is the supra elevator space, of course. So external sphincter, internal sphincter, and the intersphincteric plane. That These are the three important things. So this is, of course, a coronal image. And if you look at it axially, as you are slicing a bread, if you're slicing the anal canal as a bread, then you have the black internal sphincter as a round circle. Then you have the two thirds usually of the external sphincter that you can see in one plane. In certain planes, you will see the anterior uh, part of the sphincter, which is, which is thinner, the posterior part is thicker. And, uh, and then you will see the levator plate. And this is the ischial fossa, right? So this is the uh, axial anatomy. And again, we know about this surgical pathology. I've already talked about this similar sort of picture. Internal sphincter, external sphincter, intersphincteric abscess like this, if there is an inflammation. This is a typically what we call a perianal abscess or an ischioanal abscess. This is a supra levator sepsis. And this is also a perianal abscess. So, so oh, sorry, I, I, Mahonda will correct me. So, this is indeed a perianal abscess. Yeah. It's an ischioanal abscess. Yeah. Yes. That this is a perianal abscess. This is an intersphincteric abscess, supra limited. So this is this is a site of the acute inflammation. Okay. So, so I'm not going to talk about these concepts. Good salts rule, resting anal tone and incontinence. Uh, the in, the internal sphincter contributes to the resting anal tone. The external anal sphincter contributes to the uh, uh, active or rather than you know the what is it the voluntary. Uh, anal tone or, or con contraction and, and the relationship of the, so therefore and the other thing about surgery is that and this is something that I also report is that well, well today nowadays you've got laser uh, you've got waft you've got so many different ways of you know any disease that has got 25 different ways of treating means that none of them are really good because <laughs> Because if any of them was really good, there would not be 25 different ways of treating them. So, but what I'm trying to say is that that classical, whether you do a fistulotomy, which is, I think, backdated, if you do a fistulectomy, if you're going to do a fistulectomy, you're going to be removing this tract right up to the internal opening without damaging the mucosa. Am I right, Makunda? Uh, no, till fistulotomy is a center of care that is not obsolete. Okay. Acha, okay, okay. In okay. low fistulas, you can do a fistula. No fistula, you can do a fistula dummy. Acha. But the principle is that you will lay open the fistula. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. Will lay open, that is you will lay open the principle. fistula and you will go up to the uh, internal opening, but you will try not to damage the mucosa. Is that right? Hmm. So when you are when you are trying to lay open and when you are cutting the skin here and going through, so the key, of course, is that you don't want to cut through the external sphincter too much. So it is really important to understand that what is the height of the fistula entering the anal canal. 
because for you to reach that, you need to cut through the space. So for you to cut through the space, you need to know the height of the external sphincter. So, and this is also, uh, again, please, among surgeons, uh, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the higher you cut, the higher chance there is of an incontinence because, because the more external sphincter you're dividing, the higher the chance there is of incontinence. So therefore, these are all important facts that, you know, as a radiologist, I ought to give you not only the anatomy of the primary tract, not only the diameter of the primary tract, but I also should give you that what is how much of external sphincter is below the point where the external sphincter enters the uh, intersphincteric plane, internal sphincter and the dentate line. So all of these are important. And the reason is this particular picture. So it's, it's no different to MRI. Yeah, okay. Dr. Rajaduri, the more, yeah. more important point is the, uh, the sling, the pubirectal sling, the point where yeah. the levator is uh, meeting, yeah. the pubirectal sling is coming up. That is the point. If you go beyond that and damage the sphincter beyond what you're saying, you're going to have uh, incontinence. Because lower down, you can divide some amount yeah. of external sphincter and internal sphincter, but not beyond the sling. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, again... Uh, uh, but but correct me if I'm wrong. The sling is at the level of the anorectal junction. Yeah, exactly. So so above the sling, it is no longer anal canal. Yeah. So uh, the uh, so you've got nearly three and a half centimeter of the external sphincter below the sling, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So yeah. Uh, okay. So I will stand corrected because my understanding was that even within the three and a half centimeter of the of the external sphincter below the sling, you should, if you divide the entire three and a half centimeter, then the chances of incontinence is higher, no? No, no, not, not much. Okay. We have to preserve the sling. Okay. okay. Because okay. in, in transphincter fistula, you have to divide the external sphincter if you want to go to the deep. Yes, 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 yes. So we'll talk about that. But what I was... Uh, hoping to convince you is that when you have a higher fistula, then a fistulotomy is not a great surgery in terms that that's what I was trying to convince you that these newer treatments in terms of whether you call them laser or whatever may be more appropriate in in those higher transphincteric fistulas because the chances of dividing the length of external sphincter is less. So that is what I was trying to convince I, you. I the point is, when you have a high extension of the fistula, it is said that uh, this higher extension does not have an internal opening. The Correct. internal opening is at the dented line where Correct. the creep starts. Yes. And then if you find a fistula which is literally going higher up, you I'm can sure. just cure it. And That's just, right. Yeah. No. So, so that is the point. So, so what we need to, as both as surgeons and radiologists, what we need to clearly differentiate, in fact, from the next picture, is that the differentiation between what Makonda was talking about, the primary tract as opposed to the side extension. The side yes. extension can go anywhere. And I will show you a picture of it going into the thigh. I will show you a picture of it going into the anterior abdominal wall. So the side extension can go anywhere. And this the, the reason for recurrence of medianal fistula is, like you said, that inadequate curatage of the side extension because then you have got a residual sepsis in that in that side extension and that continues to give a recurrence so the primary tract so we need to understand this is the this is the primary tract okay so the so the four classic parks classification of the primary tract is of course the simplest or the low is in intersphinctery which starts close to the anal canal closer then goes into the intersphincteric plane this is the red is external sphincter the orange is the internal sphincter it goes into the intersphincteric plane and then opens into the anal canal okay so it does not cross any of the fibers of the external sphincter then you've got the transphincteric which i divide into as low transphincteric or high transphincteric high transphincteric can go like this come like this into the into the dentate into the dentate line into the level of the anal gland so like again dr shaha has said 95% of internal openings are at the level of the dentate line so even if a fistula starts 
however far, as long as it is intersphincteric, transphincteric, and even suprasphincteric, which is it goes up but comes down and enters the dentate line. These three still have their internal opening at the dentate line. It is only the 5% of cases of extra sphincteric fistula, which starts outside the external sphincter, goes above the levator plate to enter the rectum. It does not enter the anal canal. This is the extra sphincteric fistula, typically seen in patients with Crohn's disease. So, if you exclude this 5%, 95% of fistula will have their internal opening at the dentate line. The tract may be different. And so again, intersphincteric, transphincteric, suprasphincteric. Within transphincteric, you can have a low transphincteric like this. Even this is a transphincteric fistula because it is crossing the external sphincter. Or you yeah. can have a high transphincteric like this, right? So, uh, and then suprasphincteric, right? And also, of course, the uh, the external opening can be anterior, can be posterior. Usually, the anterior openings have straighter lines. The posterior openings have curved lines, okay, usually. Okay. So, now the extensions. So, that was a primary tract. And now the extensions. And again, this, this I believe, is the most common cause of residual sepsis and recurrence. So, so so the fifth type was not originally described by Parks. So I will come to that. So we'll start with two. So number two is the intersphincteric fistula. Okay. So here you have a small intersphincteric fistula. So this is an intersphincteric fistula. Does not involve even any fibers of the internal sphincter. Very easy to treat, to lay it open. No sphincter is involved. This is this also, is, this is, I think, extrasphincteric or, or subcutaneous fistula. Eta, number two. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So a subcutaneous fistula is also a type of a... Uh, uh, low fistula. Subcutaneous low fistula. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the this one is also uh, going through a little bit of the internal sphincter, but again, not even entering the intersphincteric plane. You're right. So it is a subcutaneous fistula, low subcutaneous fistula. We describe all of these three into one group. The reason being that because no external sphincter is involved, the implications are the same, Mahonda. So we don't actually uh, try to distinguish between these three groups. So this is an intersphincteric fistula, but this time with a little tract abscess inside the intersphincteric plane. So you need to talk about the tract and you need to talk about the tract abscess. Okay. Number one, as I said, is a is not even a fistula. It is a submucous inflammation only. It is a basically an anal gland inflammation. So this is this we see this we see this often, uh, not often we see this sometimes that a patient has got perianal pain but not got an externally visible fistula because it is the anal gland inflammation which is not manifested as a perianal abscess, which is just a small, uh, you know. In Actually, this, uh, Dr. Raju, this often manifests as submucous abscess first yes. and then it ruptures. That's right. And it's so, not exactly so a fistula so, because no external opening. Right. Just so a it's separate, a, uh, it is from the earlier part of that illness. It is just the earlier yeah. part of the illness. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying that on MRI, you will often see this. You will sometimes see this. So it is important to understand. So then we come to trans sphincteric, which is number three, which is, as you can see, starting a bit more laterally, usually. Although it doesn't mean anything, it can start, uh, it can also start here and go like this. So here is an, uh, sorry, sorry. That actually, when we say starts here, always remember that actually the fistula starts here. Yeah. So the fistula is starting here and coming outwards. It is finding the path of least resistance to come outwards. So, so when I say start here, uh, please uh, don't take it like that. We often describe on MRI the fistula starting here just for the sake of description, but actually it starts here and comes down. Anyway, so this is a transphincteric fistula. And this is what I was trying to tell you. A transphincteric fistula will cross the external sphincter, will cross the internal sphincter, will cross the intersphincteric plane, and then enter the dentate line. Now, this is the one that is surgically the most interesting thing, also the most common thing, because from here or from here or from here, you can have side extensions. You can have side extension from here. You can actually have multiple subcutaneous tracts joining into one tract here. 
So then you can have a uh, extension in the intersphincteric plane, quite common. This is, you can have a horseshoe like this in the intersphincteric plane. You can have tract abscesses at various points. Okay, so this is the one that is surgically speaking or radiologically speaking, certainly the one that is most common, the most, the one that has got the most implications in terms of management and the ones in which the radiologist and the surgeon must be on the same page is this fistula. So again, this picture, you can see that uh, this is uh, Halligan's picture. You can, uh, you can actually see this. Is, this is a transphincteric fistula with a side extension, with a tract abscess. And the tract abscess is actually above the levator plate. Yeah. So this is not a supralevator fistula. Here, the tract abscess is above the levator plate. So this for this, you don't need to necessarily do a stoma or things like that because the primary tract is still here as opposed to an extra sphincteric. My picture has been cut off. So the, an extra sphincteric which goes up here, then you will need to do something like, you know, diversion, etc. Okay. So here is an intersphincteric abscess. So as you can see here, so it starts low. This is the tract. So these are T2 sagittal, uh, sorry, T2. So just the protocol, I just quickly, I didn't talk about the protocol. So very quickly, the protocol is uh, very easy. There is, it's a 15 minute scan. There is no need to do hundreds of scans. I often see people do. You only need to do a T2 sagittal to get an overview. The other day I talked about T2 sagittal when we were talking about rectal cancer. T2 sagittal. A uh, thick section T1 axial and a thick section T2 axial, basic for any pelvic imaging. And the reason for this is to cover external, uh, the, these openings going further afield. I've seen them. Honestly, Mahunda, I have one case I've seen uh, an abscess in the medial end of the knee. And yeah, yeah. that was, uh, that was actually. Yes, <laughs> I have operated. I have operated from thigh <laughs> to the anal canal. Yes. Uh -huh. So perianal fistula, anterior abdominal wall, I have seen perivesical abscesses. I've seen all sorts of abscesses. They yes, all yes. end up in the in the perianal space. So so the, for that you need an overview. So T2 sagittal, T1 axial, T2 axial. Thick section does not have to be very fine, high resolution, just five, six millimeter thick section images. But then you need is two sets of stir or fat suppressed water excited thin section images through the perianal space through the anal sphincter so this should be perpendicular this should be uh, sorry perpendicular axial or and parallel coronal to the anal sphincter and that is the one you are going to use to classify your perianal fistula that's it and then i'll show you the, our paper in which we show that if you add contrast then the definition of the internal opening is better. That's it. So T1 axial, T2 sagittal, T1 axial, T2 axial, thin section, high resolution, small field of view, fat suppressed images of the anal sphincter, axial and coronal, post contrast axial. Finished. That's it. And honestly, this takes 15 minutes to do. And I see time and time again, even in my own centers, that people will do 12 sequences and will peep and, and, and the surgeons will get upset, the patient will get claustrophobic. So we just need to understand that what we are trying to address. We are not trying to address the whole world here. We are only trying to address the anal sphincter anatomy. So here is an intersphincteric abscess. In fact, it is almost like a subcutaneous, like Makonda was saying, because here is the internal sphincter. So it does not even cross into the uh, intersphincteric plane. So the external sphincter is outside here. This is the internal sphincter. So it is a little subcutaneous fistula. If it was, the picture is the picture is that of an intersphincteric fistula. But on, on a coronal, you will see a line. You will see a line like this. On axial, you will actually see a little dot. Oh, I got a picture here. Yeah. So see, you, you will just see a little dot in the, in the, uh, this is almost within the body of the internal sphincter. So it is certainly inside the internal sphincter. So this little dot, so this little 
tract. So this is an intersphincteric fistula. Okay. Uh, Rajudari, uh, show us the anatomy here. Yes, uh, the last picture. The uh, MR anatomy. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is the, this is the urethra. Okay. This is the anal canal. Okay. This is the internal sphincter. The, the little black thing is the internal sphincter. This large, the more black thing, so the little gray thing is the internal sphincter. This is the external sphincter going across as the pubo anal sling. Okay. It are to niche, it a puvenal sling and niche. So okay. not quite the this the same, the same muscle more cranially will go to the puvenal sling. Okay. So so here is your external sphincter, and this is your track, this little bright, this little arrow, this little bright track. So it, it will look like this: external sphincter, black is internal sphincter. You will see the intersphincteric plane, and then here is your track. Okay. So this is an axial cut. Uh, yeah, that one was axial cut. Sorry, this was this is ax so this this is a coronal, and this is axial where you are only seeing the little dot. Okay. Now this is again an intersphincteric fistula. So here is the tract, right? But you can also see a bright signal around the. The, the internal sphincter in the intersphincteric plane. This is axial cut. And this is the coronal cut in which you are not able to see the primary tract, but you are able to see these two dots. So if you think about it, this is the, this is the horseshoe. So on the coronal plane, you will see it as two little dots. Yeah. Whereas on the axial plane, you will actually see the tiny little intersphincteric fistula. So again, this little bit is the external sphincter. It on a purono chobi makonda. I I know that you are struggling. I'll I'll try to show you my good pictures if I can show you. I'll see. So this is the external sphincter. Here is the horseshoe hyperintensity, and here is the primary tract, which is an intersphincteric tract. What is the font structure? The anterior structure is uh, bladder or uh, no urethra. This is the urethra. Hello. Urethra. Can I can I call to phone call? Okay, so now we just go up into the transphincteric fistula. So uh our take a boost about we do to chobi to bright chilo So now this is a this is a transphincteric fistula with a small side extension so you can see that that the th this is the body of the external sphincter so this fistula starts outside goes outside the external sphincter comes across the dentate line to open internally but there is also a little side extension hugging the outer surface of the external sphincter but not reaching up to the levator plate. Levator plate on a open, uh, much higher. So this is this picture here. So here is a here is a transphincteric fistula. I'm sorry, bhul bhul lam. Chobita bhul. Sorry, this is in, an intersphincteric. Hey, chobita intersphincteric. Sorry, okay. ignore, uh, in, ignore this picture. This indeed is a transphincteric though. This is outside the body of the external sphincter coming. Yeah. And then opening internally and going outside. So ignore this picture. This is a this picture is that of an intersphincteric fistula with a little side extension. Now this is a suprasphincteric fistula. You can see the tract going up. It's very difficult to see it in one plane. It goes up, goes up, up, almost goes up to the level of the levator plate, then comes down and opens into the dentate line much rarer but we do see it from time to time how, how, to, how to make out the levator plate how to make out the levator plate in the film uh, you can see the levator plate very well uh, the levator plate will be at this level here okay. uh, uh, just ha, ha, so 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 it is because remember this is not a t2 usually it's a fat suppressed image 
So it is more difficult to see, but you will see the dark fibers of the levator plate going like this very clearly on the coronal plane. And on the axial plane, when you go up to that level, you will see it. On the coronal plane, you will see the levator plate in every image. So the levator plate is somewhere here. So I, I will try to show you uh, pictures. So, okay. So here you can see it very well. This is a T2 weighted image. So this is the levator plate. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is a levator plate. Uh, so on, on, a, on a fat suppressed stirred image, because everything is, the fat is suppressed, right? The fat is suppressed to black on a fat suppressed image. So both the both the uh, perirectal fat and the ischial fat is suppressed to black. You understand? Because it has yeah. been suppressed. And the levator muscle is also black. So therefore, it is more difficult to see. But you can you can see it. The, 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 there is a difference in the in, in the anatomy. You will be able to see it. But on T2, you can see it so well, right? It's the same place where it will be. So this is the levator plate. Now, this is an extra sphincteric fistula. This is a fibrotic dark extra sphincteric fistula opening internally into the rectum. Can you see it here? So this is this is not a fat suppressed image. This is a T2 weighted image. And on a T2 weighted image, if something is dark, that means it does not have fluid. So therefore, it is fibrotic. So it is more like a chronic extra sphincteric fistula tract. But the internal opening is still got active, some active inflammation, and that is why it is T2 bright. Okay. So uh, we talked about this already. Now, one of the things that we do is that when um, because, because oftentimes the technicians are not able to understand the plane of the anal canal and they can often do the axial cuts in, in not a plane that is not suitable for you. So you can actually nowadays do a, like a volume sequence through the anal canal and then you can reconstruct it to any level that you like. So that is called a T1 vibe. I do that typically the post contrast sequence. I do it like that so that I can reconstruct it in any way I like. Unfortunately, Wakanda, my movies will not show. Otherwise, I would have shown you this. Okay. So, what does your surgeon want to know and what is it that you want to report? What does your, what, what should be the content of your report? So, the content of your report should be about the primary tract. Is it superficial, like you said, subcutaneous superficial? Is it intersphincteric, transphincteric, suprasphincteric, extrasphincteric? Or is it just a sinus, anal gland inflammation, and not an abscess? I mean, 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 and is the horseshoe in an intersphincteric level, infralivator or supralivator level? Horseshoes. The internal opening on what o'clock? The external opening on what o'clock? How far from the external, from the anal canal? And how many? Okay. okay. And the other thing that we need to talk about is this combination of this concept that when we talk about, whenever we try to compare the results of MRI and surgery, what is the gold standard? Traditionally, we have always said that surgery is the gold standard, right? But we know this for a fact that even surgery at UA, surgery is not the gold standard. So the, surgery, the gold standard that is currently used in the surgical references is something what is called the outcome derived reference standard and not UA alone which is combination of two tests rather than just the surgical findings. So basically your surgical findings and the MRI findings together makes the outcome derived reference standard. Okay, so I will not go through this uh, thing, but we worked on this, that outcome derived reference standard on 85 patients. And we found basically that 
uh, uh, okay, this is still. We found that actually MRI was very good with a sensitivity of ninety-seven percent and a specificity of ninety percent when compared to the outcome-derived reference standard. And if you compare, this is our own paper. Actually, we compared uh, locating extensions, uh, identifying horseshoes, or locating abscesses. The the results were very good, and the surgical correlation was also very good. Okay, so I think we. I let me see if I can show you some better pictures than what I've shown you so far. As I was telling you, the role of the sagittal T two is to see the overall length and extent of the abscess. So here is a sagittal sequence, right? So this is the rectum extending up. You can see that this is a patient with Crohn's disease. There is inflammation in the rectum as well. And here is a fistulous connection to the anal canal, big wide fistulous connection. And it comes down as a perianal abscess, but also extends anteriorly in front of the bladder to open in the anteroabdominal wall. So we have seen similar cases going down to the thigh. Now, now the, here is the same case. You can see this. This is the... So Makonda, can I convince you now this black bit yeah. is the external sphincter? Yes. So this is the typical picture you will see, not the pictures I was showing you. So, so this is the external sphincter. Uh, the internal sphincter is this little gray. The intersphincteric plane is in between. And here is a, you see part of the transphincteric tract, same as this tract here, transphincteric tract. And this is the anterior extension going like this. The anterior extension is this one, sorry, this one. And then craniocaudally, this anterior extension is going up and down along the anteroabdominal wall like this, right? So if you if I did a sagittal image, if I did an axial image higher up, I will see two spots here. You understand? Yeah. Uh, what are, uh, last picture. What are the two white lines deep to the uh, internal sphincter? Two white lines near the lumen of the anal canal. Yes, yes. So this is also still this is what what I was showing you that there is some inflammation in the mucosa, right? Okay, okay. So there is I mean this is this is Crohn's. This is not this is not a simple perianal fistula. This is Crohn's. So there is inflammation of the mucosa. Here is the fistulous connection. Here is the anterior extension. So this anterior extension corresponds to this <laughs> on sagittal. This craniocaudal extension you are not seeing it in axial because it is going up and down, right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know whether you saw those pictures of 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 the people that uh, on the were on the sides, and uh, uh, the Charles Dickens, Fred Salmon, Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, this one I can't really remember. Okay, Charles Ferris, and this guy called Walter Sickart. Do you know that? This was the, the famous, what, murder second, Makunda? Uh -huh. Famous London murders. Uh -huh. Because he went to St. Mark's to get his fistula treated. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, all these guys suffered from perianal fistula. Okay. Now, I was, this, I was hoping to show you the cases, but unfortunately, the movies are not working. Uh, yes, show the static picture. Static picture in the oh, points. Un unfortunately, they their movies, the, the start points are not. Uh, so I've got some these wonderful cases where actually what I do is I draw a picture like this. Even when I report, I draw a picture like this to the surgeon. But you don't uh, get all the pictures all the time. You don't send me, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the unfortunately, this is this is how I draw. Yeah. Uh, very sorry. I mean, protrude lode chikal ke. Achha, okay. It just shows some normal structures in these uh, cuts. Uh, here also, this one you can write. So let's try to do this. Yeah, we can make out the fistula here on the left yeah, you side. Can. You can. But, but this is the problem, you know. It's, it's all about going back up and down. To, to try to understand that where where is the so to me this is possibly without going up and down and on the Nayaka, so I can't remember so you know uh, 
sorry the other thing i wanted to talk, talk to you just give me one second can i just uh, give me one second okay. so the other thing is that you know you just as an mri reporter or as a surgeon who's looking at an mri film you just need to break it down into these can I see my internal opening? The best way to see the internal opening is the axial scan, right at the level of the dentate line. That is the o'clock. Now, sometimes if you don't see it, do look at the coronal scan. And on MRI, you will always see a cross-reference point, right? That on the this coronal point, where does it correspond to on the axial point? So if you can see the coronal uh, internal opening, put your cross reference, it will show you where the axial opening is. Okay, so this is the, your first thing. The second thing is then identify the two sphincters and see whether you can see the tract as an intersphincteric, transphincteric, low, high transphincteric, suprasphincteric, extrasphincteric. Let's concentrate on the first two, inter and trans, because that is 80% of all your fistulas. Once you have seen that, once you have identified the tract, then try to follow that tract up and down and see whether you can see an extension going from that tract. The extension can be anywhere. It can be intersphincteric. It can be extrasphincteric, the extension. It can come down intersphincteric and open with a further external opening. Remember this. This is the one bit that I did not talk. When you see three openings of an perianal fistula, it doesn't mean that there are three internal openings. So usually, yeah. internal openings are single, single internal opening. Yes, absolutely. Because the anal gland inflammation is only one. So, it is therefore better for you as a surgeon to start from the internal opening to come outwards. So, if you come outwards and if you see the primary tract, sometimes you will see that there is another tract like this with an external opening here. Okay. Then the third thing you look at is, is there a tract abscess? And the reason for tract abscess is, of course, that you need to go and drain that tract abscess. Otherwise, you're going to have persistent sepsis. In fact, Dr. Rajaduri, uh, yeah. that is the concept of lift operation. Lift. Yes. You just uh, dissect the fistula tract in the intersphincteric plane, ligate it there. And the uh, remaining tract, you just cure it. Yes. Yes. You have to so, address the internal opening area. So you basically, you go like, uh, so you, you, in lift, which is actually not that similar to the laser procedure. The laser procedure, what you're doing is you are actually going through here. You're you're in, yeah. in lift. You're, you're lift. You ligating. start here. Yes, you start here. In lift your you start here. Ligate that track. But boss, even in laser, yeah, you are you are going and either burning or ligating here only. Yeah, yeah. And Same. then the the instead of curating, you are just putting a laser. That is the yeah, difference. Yeah. That's it. But otherwise, the principle is the same. You are actually going into this plane and putting it there. I have a theory. I wanted to do this. That this point you can see on trans ultrasound and I want to do this. That I will go percutaneously go and laser this place. Okay. And then you come uh, retrograde from that and plane? No, and no, from there you, you, put a, uh, you put a wire, a catheter and put a laser here. Okay. Why not? Hmm. Anyway, and side, but, side branches you can put a laser no 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 see side branches you can put a laser yes but yes. sometimes it becomes difficult to negotiate into these side branches so so that is why that is why I think that the you know why surgeons and radiologists should work together I, th I think this if this is done in an OT setting with a good fluoroscopy you know in the old days when you used to do, when we used to do fistulograms. We used to see these tracts, no? So if you can see this tract, you can put a terumo and a catheter and go with a, a sheath and then you can put a laser and then you can you can deal, deal with it. But anyway, let me finish what I was saying. Okay. So what I was saying was that this tract here, going like this, it can, it can have further tracts coming down. It can have tracts coming down here here, here. It can even have a horseshoe going like this 
and then a track coming on the other side. But the internal opening is still only here. So what I'm trying to say to you is that when you, you, you know that in surgical practice, you see this, that you have got external openings on both sides of the anal canal. And you are wanting to find out that what is the tract. And I, I wish I had so many pictures and I'm so sorry I have not got it sorted. But just I want to show you this, that you can have a transfinctory fistula, let's say, opening here. Then a horseshoe going back like this into the intersphincteric plane. And then from this point here coming down. So your external opening is one on the right, one on the left. Hello? Apni Bangla Ingriji Kunta Bojedna. Bangla Bojedna. Tapna Kajami Bulla, I make a class Nichi, I make to party from Kuchi, Baba. Tell the Apni Busta Bresson, Hindi the Bolbo, Modi Hindi the Bolta Bolish. Thank you. Thank you. So what I wanted to say was that the, 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 you can have a horseshoe and an ex, in, external opening on the other side. Even then you have an opening in one side only and the primary tract is one only. Okay, so let me just quickly go to that picture that we were. Okay, so it at the to the yeah. So 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 you see that the external opening is here. There is a tract, and this is what I was trying to show you. See, there is an there is a cross tract across the midline onto the other side. See this? And from this point here, this is like a horseshoe. It's a quadrant, it's not a complete horseshoe, it's a quadrant. You can have a horseshoe as a entire circle, circular horseshoe. You can have a hemispheric horseshoe. You can have a quadrantic horseshoe, only 90 degrees. You can have it. And then from this point, you can have an external opening coming like that also. also. Okay. Uh, Dr. Raju, in that case, uh, which side will take as a primary? Suppose the one that... It's a good question. Good question. The one that goes straight into the process, the sphincters to go into the internal opening. Okay. Okay. So for example, here, the internal opening is on this side. So it goes like this to the internal opening and then there is a track, right? So the, it is a left-sided primary track. Then a, then a horseshoe. From the horseshoe, you can have an inferior extension. So the, exactly the same way you can have a cranial extension towards the levator plate. You can have an inferior extension to open into an external opening as a second or third opening. You can. So this is this is the sort of the picture. See. Okay. Can I see this track? So sometimes, sometimes, particularly. Anterior tracts are much rarer. Posterior tracts are much more common, right? In perianal yes. fistula, anterior tracts are rarer. Sometimes yes. Yes. it is very, uh, you know, there is a very small tract. It starts anteriorly at 12 o'clock, crosses the external sphincter. Anterior tracts almost always are transphinctory because, because because anteriorly the external sphincter is here, it will cross the external sphincter and it will go anteriorly and open off sometimes on either side of the, uh, you know, of the root of the scrotum. So it will follow the anoscrotal raphi and will open on either side of the root of the scrotum. I have even seen it to point anteriorly at the inguinal region. It can for the anterior tracts. So I would have loved to show you this picture. This must have been a very complex fistula, but I can't show you. Sorry, very many apologies. Yes, yes. 
Achha. Now we have some uh, idea about this uh, different types of fistula. It's good. So these are all my movies. Is my screen visible? No. No, not yet. So I can identify my movies, but I can't play them. I don't know why. So let me see. I mean, I cannot, you know, I, I tried uh, till two o'clock last night. Something has happened. So these are all the movies you see, we have, uh, but I can't even copy them. I have no idea why. One of your young boys with technical expertise yeah. must come and help me. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I tried with VLC. I tried with uh, the keynote. What, I, what it has done is with a recent upgrade, it is not playing dot, dot .mov movies. So all okay. my... Uh, uh, Dr. Shura Rajagiri, yeah. Madam Banerjee is asking to just show a pelvis uh, and description of the landmarks. Just a... Just one, just quick uh, recapitulation of uh, the different areas, the outside muscles, and the uh, other structure, just a view of the pelvic area. Just one second. Yeah. Where is my... Okay, I think yeah. I have. <laughs> I think. Let me just quickly check. Okay, was this is uh, the patient is turned upside down. So pardon me, because I have not seen this picture for a long time. So I might uh, have to do it with you. Okay, so I think this is my colleague talking. Internal opening, okay. So the, again, this is, this is I think this was a workshop sort of a scenario. And uh, like I said, internal opening, external opening, primary tract, secondary tract, residual sepsis, mucosal abnormality. This is Sharad's presentation, actually. Uh, 47-year-old male, necrotizing fasciitis, managed aggressively, perianal fistula, seton, put in. And this is the MRI. Okay. So, uh, this is not conventionally how I would put the picture, but uh, what he has done is his, uh, this patient is, let's let's assume this patient is prone. Okay. So, uh, so this is the backside. This is the scrotal uh, area. So, this is anterior. So, because the patient is prone, this is right, this is left, okay? So, he is uh, talking like this. One second. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Madam Banerjee, this is bladder. This is obturator internus on the side. This is the sacrum or the lower sacrum of the coccyx. This is obviously the acetabulum on two sides. Uh, and here is the abnormal tract. Okay, this is the fistula tract. The anal canal picture is not so clear here. So, okay, this might be better. So we are coming, we are coming from below upwards, I think. Okay. Scrotum. This is the anoscrotal rafi. So here is our okay, right. Now on this picture here, this little gray. Dr. Banerjee, this little gray is the internal sphincter just coming. 
and external sphincter is the blacker one always external sphincter is darker internal sphincter is grayer okay and you can already see this tract appearing right you can see this tract appearing yeah 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 so yes. the tract is outside the body of the external sphincter yeah yes this this is the external sphincter it is outside the body of the external sphincter so therefore we already know that this is at least a transphincter okay so here is a tract outside the body okay now here is a tract now can you see the tract turning medially yes this is the tract going to turn medially to open into the dentate line uh, but, is it that you got an abscess also because see the yeah, widening no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll show you i'll show you so so just follow the primary tract first this is the primary tract yeah and this is the primary tract here okay okay no so okay 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 start again start again so this is the primary tract this is a tiny little tract abscess this is the, again the primary tract and now here is the tract turning medially to open internally so this is almost like a suprasphincteric fistula while the side extension keeps on extending anteriorly towards the scrotum anteriorly okay you follow me and yes, you are yes. asking me about the anatomy so actually this is a this is a little blind tract abscess it is not going anywhere this is the one that is going and opening so this if i drew a coronal picture would be something like like this like this if uh, i are these two muscles liberated on either side either so, side muscles are liberated yeah yeah this one so this is partly the uh, no this is partly the liberator partly also the obturator internus liberator are okay. okay okay yeah so let me see what else is there in this talk i have no idea what else is there. oh so this is going further for further up you can see this is the very large tract abscess okay he wants to okay so So this is the levator plate, Dr. Banerjee. Th this is on a coronal plane. This is the levator plate. You will see it on both sides. It is like this. So this is in the setting of rectal cancer as far as the fistula anatomy is concerned. So the gray is the internal sphincter and the blacker one is the external sphincter going towards the symphysis pubis. And you will see a thinner column of anterior component of the sphincter. So this is the sphincter anatomy. And as you go upwards, this external sphincter, the puboenal sling component of the external sphincter will merge imperceptibly with the levator plate. Yeah. Here, there, there you are. This is a very good picture. So this is the levator plate. As it comes down on the coronal, it becomes an external sphincter. And it will be the anteriorly in the axial plane, it will be the pivoinal sling. It's exactly this. Look. Levator plate, external sphincter, and then it will extend anteriorly as the pivoinal sling. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Yeah, all right. All right. Thank you, Makunda. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shodri. Exactly. Levator plate to Purishka dekte paven. Levator plate to dahata pane normal T2 weighted images agdom dark dupashe fat thakwe sutarang dekte kup shubida hai. Thank you, thank you. Amar Yegulo actor movie or chulchena. Achari din dekbo. Tigacha, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. We I'm sorry, I could not show you the all the fissure, but in these discussions are always good. Yeah. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.